they're both called the authentication one. So really, when you guys make your list of functional requirements, sign in and log out should be one and the same. Station or whatever with the website. So what I did is I modified that project uh, by first of all taking getting rid of the foreign keys in the database because really after you have reverse engineered your database and created your entities and your entity managers at that point you want hibernate to handle the relationships and not the database so what I did was I took out the foreign keys from the database and then two functional requirements implemented, which are timesheet list and enter hours. So I go through that, which version two didn't have that. Version two only had timesheets. Timesheet, I'm sorry, timesheet list. Version three now has enter hours. So now we're able to create new timesheets or update the timesheets. Um, and then, if you guys remember. At the beginning of, of, of this course, I ask you to please make sure that you create um, HTML static versions of each one of your functional requirements. So I have also included those in, in this project. I have taken all the static pages with cascading style sheets and JavaScripts and the menus and all that stuff and I have included them so that we can have a really smooth navigation of the website. That means that some of the pages that I'm going to be taken to are static HTML. That's fine. At least I have a sense of the look and feel of the website. And other ones I'm going to be I'm going to be taken to a real page with data coming from the database. Specifically timesheet list and enter hours so far. Now all tests J unit testing, two unit two entity managers, two controllers, and the CRUDs are passing green. So that's what's important. That the changes that you make, whether you are implementing a new functional requirement or you are updating an existing previously implemented functional requirement, the idea is that at the end when you have when you're complete with that, you go and test your unit tests they should pass green. If they are not passing green, something is wrong. You have to go and fix it. Or maybe you have to tweak the test. Now the test becomes something different. That's something that you got to keep in mind. All right. So enough of that. Let's go straight into the changes. So I'm going to download the one, the version 2 that I share with you guys. And I'm going to download it into my Rapid Java workspace. I'm going to be calling it Auto Web 2. Okay? And I'm going to use my tool, the comparison tool. I mean, let's start from from the database because that's going to give us an idea of, of the real changes that were driven from from the database the timesheet hibernate mapping. Okay. If you guys remember, and this is a hibernate mapping that was created automatically for us by the reverse engineer process. Initially we had lazy false, we changed that, and we had fetch select for the employee of that timesheet and also for the department of that timesheet. What I have done, and this is something that I noticed as I started developing the enter hours functionality, is that I needed 
to include the department ID and the employer ID this time she belongs to. Which was something that the reverse engineer skipped. It ignored. Why? Why did the reverse engineer do that? Because he was already providing the actual employee, the object itself. He was providing this whole employee, and he was providing this whole department objects that belong to this timesheet. Okay? But at this point, what I want to do is I want to be able to have my own property in the timesheet called department ID and employer ID. They're matching their corresponding columns called department ID and employee ID. And here it is. Every time she has an employee ID and a department ID. The employee ID is the one that belongs, is the owner of that timesheet, and the department ID is the one that is the department that gets charged with that time. What else have I modified? Well, I kept the lazy false, but now I may find I might find myself creating a timesheet in which I have not specified what department it belongs to or what employee it belongs to. Okay? So at this point, what I have done is I have included a few attributes in the many-to-one relationship to the employee and to the department. These relationships are, if, if it's not found, just ignore it. Do not cascade. In other words, we're not going to delete, update, or add an employee from the timesheet perspective. So do not cascade. That's why we have included cascade in none. Insert false and update false. Okay? Same thing for the department. If it's not found, just ignore it. Cascade on, insert false, update false. Uh, for the payment, remember there's also one payment associated to the timesheet. If there's no payment associated with this payment, I mean with this timesheet, that's fine. Ignore it. So that's why I have added the not found, ignore. Okay. This is all part of the fine-tuning that you have to do in your Hibernate configuration. All right, entities, only one entity change. Which one? Timesheet. How? Well, we have added those private properties, remember? These two private properties are department ID and employee ID. Now, notice that they're not integers. They're int. And I hope you guys, this is Java 101, okay? I hope you guys remember this. There's a difference between the integer variable of class integer and the int variable of type int, okay? Uh, they both represent an integer, but this int, it's what it's called a primitive in Java, while this integer it's what it's called a class in Java. Okay, and this distinction is going to make sense later on when I explain um, the enter hours functionality. So at this point, we just have created those two, right? And obviously, we have created the getters and setters for it. And what else? And the get total minutes. The get total minutes I am calculating as minutes Monday, the integer value, plus minutes Tuesday, the integer value, etc. We're adding them all up. So we're creating this get total minutes uh, functionality by adding the integer value of them. That's it. That's pretty much the change. Now, how does that affect the timesheet manager itself? Well, the timesheet manager, we wanted to make sure that it was going to be consistent all across the different 
functions and methods inside the timesheet manager. So if you guys remember, initially we had the reads types of functionalities, we had them with no session. So for instance, when we were doing a find by ID, we were just getting the we were getting we were opening a new session and then without doing any transaction whatsoever in that session, we were directly trying to get the read out of it. Right? But if it was a create or an update or a delete, then like in the case of this delete, then we will make sure that we um, get the current session, begin the transaction, do the whatever functionality we're doing, and then committing the transaction. So basically what we did is, or what I did, was standardize all the methods to one type of implementation, and that was the implementation that uses transactions. We want to make sure that nobody's going to be interfering with that um, with that transaction that we're doing using the same session. That's basically what we're trying to do. So if we were trying to do an update and somebody was doing a read before, then if we updated, that read would no longer be uh, a valid read for that person unless we include those into a transaction. And that's it. Okay, so what else have I modified? <coughs> well, I have added all the static HTML pages, like I said. So we're, I'm going to have an approved timesheets HTML and an enter hours HTML. These are all hard coded. When you see an HTML, these are all hard coded. But the fact that I have them inside my web content, it's going to allow me to navigate through the website as if the whole website is being implemented. Obviously, I have changed the links, the menu links, in some of, in some of those HTML pages by sending me to an HTM link not in HTML. Remember, the HTM link is the one that is taken care of by, by Spring. So when I'm sent, I'm, when I'm being sent to timesheet list, I would actually be going to the timesheet list JSP. Okay. Now another question that came up was why are we using why are we putting our JSPs inside a JSP folder inside the webinf? Well, the webinf is a special folder because it's a folder that nobody has access to. This folder is inside web content. Everybody has access to everything that is inside web content. That's where our HTMLs live, that's where our images live, that's where our JavaScript lives, that's where our styles live, okay? But anything that you put inside the webinf will not be uh, reachable from, from, the, from the request outside in the browser. So what does that mean? That means that nobody will be able to go into our timesheet list JSP and figure out how it was implemented. Okay? That's so it's a security reason in other words. It's a secure reason why we put our JSPs inside a JSP folder inside our web inf. Now, what other changes have I done? If we take a look at the timesheet list, Timesheet list uh, now has the menu cascading style sheets, the JavaScript that I needed, everything pretty much that make it look or make it behave with the same look and feel as the rest of the website. So I just basically, you know, added links to to the images, I mean not to the images, to the uh, styles and JavaScript. And if you guys look at it, 
remember that should be done like this you know it's a link the hyper reference is styles that's where the folder is and then menu that CSS that's what I call my menu uh, cascading style sheet and also the JavaScripts they're in the folder JavaScript and then you just point to the JS and and that's it that that's what makes the JSP have the same look and feel as the rest of the HTML pages in your website. I also added the enter hours, of course, because that's the new functionality that I have implemented. Uh, what else? As far as the tests, this tests stay the same. I didn't need to do any changes in the tests. Um, I also made some changes in the log4j. This is something that maybe I didn't uh, cover very uh, much in detail a few weeks ago, but um, we had it initially set up as info, so only stuff like that was like a warning or an error or a fatal or an info will come out. And I noticed that I was not getting everything that I needed in the logs, so I incremented it to debug level. So a anything that is debug, info, warn, error, etc., will show up. But <clears throat> I also noticed that anything that was related to the Spring Framework, and this is how you fine tune your logging, you can actually tell log4j hey I want you to log anything that starts with org dot spring framework do only errors or anything that starts with uh, for instance uh, what, what, what are our packages com that uh, spring no um, timex auto web just do warnings. So you can actually fine tune by the package, by the package you can fine tune what kind of debugging level each package will have. That's including the jars that you have included in your in your project. So I noticed that we had our spring framework only logging when there was an error. And I needed to see more than that. So that's why I also incremented the debugging level of the Spring Framework up to debugging, to debug level. So I made those changes, and uh, and that's it. That's pretty much it. I included a new backup of the database. If you guys look at the backup of the database, and I'm going to try to compare this one to that one notice that pretty much the only changes that I did on the database was that before I had foreign keys now I don't okay so when you get rid of the foreign keys in the database you obviously also getting rid of the on delete cascade and on update cascade. You're going to let Hibernate handle that. And actually, your Hibernate mappings, as you fine tune them, you're actually going to be able to say, yes, I want to delete um, on delete cascade if you need to. But you're going to be able to do that on Hibernate mapping, not the database automatically doing it. Like in this case, that's how it was. Okay? Same for the foreign keys in the payments. Same for the foreign keys in the timesheets. All right? Okay, so if I go into my Timex Auto Web. I'm going to close all everything that I had. 
directly go into the tests package and run all tests. And this is something that I may have covered or maybe not, I don't remember. But this all tests is a class, okay, that extends from the test case. Very similar to the, all the other test cases that we have created. But it has a function called suite. And this suite actually will allow you to create several tests at one point in time. So <clears throat> what you can do is you can create a new test suite and we're going to call it the manager's tests. Okay? And then we're going to create another test suite and we're going to call it the controller's test. And later on we're going to have another bunch of uh, tests under a different title. Uh, and there, every single one of those suites will have tests, test cases inside it. So, for instance, for the manager's tests, you're going to add the test to the timesheet home test. That's the timesheet manager test. And you're going to also add the department manager test. And later on, when we create the employee manager test, and then later on when we create the payments manager test, we're going to be adding more of those tests into this suite. So what does that give you? Well, what's the what's the importance about? Well, you will be able to run the entire suite of tests in one run. You just say, hey, all tests, run it as a J unit. So you're going to run all the tests as a J unit test. And it will go and run all the manager tests and then when it's done it will go and run all the controllers tests, etc, etc. And these are all the tests running behind the scenes. Okay. So for the timesheets manager I have tested the persist, the find by ID, the merge, the delete, and the get timesheets. For the department manager test, I have tested the persist, the find by ID, the merge, and the delete. The cruds, pretty much. For the controllers test, the timesheet list controller, since it's the, m the simplest of, of them, then I'm just testing the test handle request. Right, and for the enter hours, which is a little bit more complicated, I'm actually testing uh, having uh, a form backing object that it's brand new, like in, in the case when you have a brand new timesheet, or testing the form backing object that already exists in the database, like an existing timesheet. Okay, so it's two different types of tests. Also, the unsubmit. Doesn't matter if the unsubmit is from a brand new or from an existing one. What what am I going to test? Well, the fact that the timesheet is going to be saved when it gets submitted. Also, the binder, the data binder. And this is one of the key issues that we're going to see when I explain in a, in a little bit some of the changes that I did in the inter hours controller. Um, the data binder, remember, is the one that allows us to modify the data that is being input in the browser to the data that is going to be saved in the database. Sometimes the the data types do not agree and you have to do some kind of data type conversion or maybe the units do not agree we might be capturing hours and we, we might save in minutes. So we need a data binder that that um, that modifies all those properties. And then finally the reference data. I want to make sure that I can test that the data that I'm referencing back to the JSP is indeed what I'm supposed to send to the JSP. So I I pretty much run all those tests 
so that <clears throat> okay so I guess the next step will be to debug it and this is something that you guys should be able to handle as well instead of starting the server I want you to restart it in debug mode so that's going to shut down the server and then start it back again in debug mode and then what I want you to do is take your enter hours controller okay, and put stops or breakpoints where you want your execution to stop. So we're going to stop at the form backing object. We're going to stop at the init binder. We're going to stop at the reference data. We're going to stop at the unsubmit. And that's it. So we're going to be able to see the sequence of events that happen inside the controller by debugging it. So let's try it again. We click on the link. Notice that it immediately being taken to Eclipse. What's the first thing that executes in the controller? form back in object. That's the first thing that executes. Because he has to prepare that object that is going to be the back of that page, of that form in that page. That's why it's called the form back in object. So what am I going to do? I'm going to request, I'm going to ask the request whether there's a parameter in the TID and the request will tell me, hey, is there an attribute? Call TID and we, we can go right into it and find out that indeed there is an attribute. TID is, stands for, yeah, it's the TID. So if the request is different than null, let's see, let's step over it. Yes, it is. So at this point, we're going to ask the timesheet manager to find us that timesheet. And I'm going to go, not, I'm not going to go through that. I'm just going to step over that. Notice all the hibernate queries behind the scenes creating that timesheet for us. Actually going and finding it and creating it. And here it is. It, put it, it puts it under timesheet. So by pulling that timesheet, he has created this object. Notice that it already knows what the department is. The department is information technology from Florida, everything. Notice that the department ID is 4. It already populated that. Notice that it already knows that the employee is who? Mike Dover, 123 Main Street in Davie. This is the email. This is his pay rate. It knows absolutely everything. Why? Because Lacey was not false. I'm sorry, Lacey was false. We don't want it to be uh, lazy. We want it to load everything. So it loaded the employee, it loaded the department, it already populated the employee ID. It has done pretty much all that stuff for us. Then what do we do? We set the status of that timesheet to pending, no matter what. And then that's the one that we're going to return to, the JSP, that timesheet. So we run it. Hey, before it sends that form backing object to the JSP, what are we executing? The init binder. Why? Because we have a timesheet right now 
that contains minutes. Remember, in the database, all timesheets contain minutes. Well, those minutes must be converted. So we are calling the init binder to make sure that we are going to convert them. So we register the custom editor for minutes and all that stuff for the date. Okay. Yes, question. We, you only need the init bind you only need to override the init binder if we you have conversions. Yes. That's a good point. If you don't have any conversions, you don't need to put any code under the init binder. No, you just don't declare it. Init binder is a method that is already implemented in the simple form controller. But in the enter hours controller, you can override it. You can say, no, I'm going to be providing the implementation of that init binder. And that's how you override it. Okay. All right, so at this point, we just run it, and it says, Whoa, wait a minute, there's one more thing that I have to execute. So I have executed the form backing object, I have it ready. I have executed the uh, init binder, so I know what massage I have to do to the data. There's one last thing that I need to do, and that is create the reference data. So at this point, we're going to create a hash map. And that hash map is our model. And we're going to put a variable named department, and it's going to be populated with a list of departments, all of them. And we're going to return that model to the JSP page. So we do that. that there is the Hibernate querying all the departments. And then if we go back to, here it is. Now I'm going to change that Sunday to 10 hours. So instead of being, and th notice this, you guys notice this? What's wrong here? It's not being converted, it's actually staying in minutes. Oh wow. Where do we do that? Where do we convert that into minutes? Well. The enter hours has this command total minutes. Right? But it's bound. I see it bound. What's command? Timesheet. So there should be a getter for total minutes in timesheet. Where is it? Probably at the end. Nope. Right here. Get total minutes. You guys see what happened here? What is get total minutes returning? Do we need to massage data if it's a string or a primitive? No. That's why it's never converting it. It has to be an integer in order for this to be converted. So what we can do is to fix it is declared as an integer. If we declare as an integer, then it's going to go through the minutes property editor, which is the one that converts minutes to hours and hours to minutes. And we're going to do that in a little while. 
But right now, all I'm going to do is I'm going to modify 10 hours here. So that's going to be it was 56, now it should be 58 hours. And we're going to click on save. Now we're going back to our debugging. What's the first thing that gets executed when we go back from the front end to the back end? What's the first thing that it gets executed? Init binder. Why? Because that's the guy that is going to convert everything that is uh, in the front end to through the minutes properties and through all the custom editors that we declared different than an in, uh, the, different than a string or a primitive. So it's going to do the conversion from the hours to the minutes. So we're going to step through that. And then what's the next thing that it that executes? Once it does all the massaging, the unsubmit. Remember, the unsubmit will get executed only when you have all everything from the front prepared and ready, and you are ready to actually save it. On submit. Okay? This is where you say, hey, command, which is the name of the object that is being passed, I'm going to cast it into a timesheet, because I know it's going to be a timesheet. Okay? Now, there is going to be cases in which, and we're going to see that in some other function, in a, some other functional requirement. There's going to be a form backing object that you're getting that it's not one of your entities. It's like a combination of two different entities or maybe a list of your one of your entities. Guess what? You're going to have to create that class. You're going to have to create that class because that's going to be your form backing object for that specific functional requirement. So in this case, I know it's a straightforward timesheet, right? So I'm going to convert it into the timesheet. Then I'm going to say, hey, look into the parameters from the request and see if you have any send mail. If I would have hit submit, it would have been send mail. If I hit save, it doesn't send an email. If I hit save, the timesheet will still be pending. If I hit submit, the timesheet will now be submitted. So it changes status. And that's what I actually what I'm asking here. Is there a parameter called send email? No. Or yes? If it's yes, then I'm sorry, if it's no, then the timesheet status is still pending. But if it's yes, then the timesheet status will be S for submitted. Okay, so next. This is when we say, hey, timesheet manager, attach dirty. Remember, that's one of the uh, functions created by our reverse engineer process. Attach dirty. That means this timesheet, I know it exists. It's in its dirty stage, which means it hasn't been really saved, right? I want you to attach this dirty timesheet to the database and the timesheet manager is going to do that so right now if we take a look at our timesheets that particular timesheet is 480 480 480 480 480 480 and 480 so we're going to execute it We're going to set the attribute uh, message, and I go, I went through that. The, there's going to be a message that says, hey, we successfully entered the hours. So we're going to run that. And now if we query our database, notice that now this value is now 10 hours. It's no longer 480. Now it's 600. And we're back to timesheet list. We want to see this as hours, not as 
five minutes. We go into our JSP and we find out that indeed we're binding it. But get total minutes is returning an int. So it's never going through the binding process. What can we do? We can convert what get total minutes returns, we can convert it into an integer so that it goes through the binding process. Where do we do that? In the actual timesheet. So we're going to declare instead of an int, we're going to say it's going to be an integer. Now we just modified an entity. We didn't modify a JSP, we modified an entity. When we do that, we have to rebuild the project. That's going to force the project to be Package and redeploy it again into Tomcat. Here it is. You guys saw that? And now I refresh. By refreshing, I'm executing again the entire debugging process. So I'm just going to skip through that. Now, what do we see? 58 hours. The also thing that we also wanted to play with was the pure ending date. Notice that right now, the date in the JSP is being displayed right here. Pure ending date from command. Okay? And we are formatting that date like this. What happens if we... Are we asking for that date? No, we're not. It's displaying, but we're not asking for that date as an input. What happens if we get rid of that init binder? I'm going to get rid of it. So I'm going to get rid of the simple data format, the customer, and I'm going to, not going to register that. Save it. I don't know. Project, clean, package, deploy back into Tomcat, refresh. Play, play, play. Nothing. It kept it the same. Why? Because we're not asking for that data. Now, suppose that we were asking for that date. That date's going to, uh, Spring is going to assume that is a. Uh, string. So when we try saving it on the back end, it's not going to save it because we're not doing the conversion. Um, so we don't really need that custom date editor unless we're asking for a date. What else? Oh, the employee. Good point. We want it to make l make sure that it looks like this. Right? So we're missing employee column and then the name of the employee. That's a what? That's a JSP change. So we're going to enter hours. And right before the peer ending date, right before the peer ending date, we're going to put this. within the same paragraph, right? Do we want another 
the same table data? Uh, probably. I'm not sure. What am I going to do? Employee. Name. Now, where am I going to get the employee name from? It's not going to really be a format date. It's going to be probably a C out. You guys remember what that stands for, right? The C and the F and all that. C stands for, there's a tag that comes from the Java standard tag library the core. The FMT means that it's coming from the Java standard tag library, the format. And you can have several libraries that do seven different things. And you just have that prefix as part of your tag. So any tag that is Spring Framework related will have the Spring prefix. Which you already know that. Okay. Uh, so at this point, we're going to say C out. The value is going to be command, which is what? Timesheet dot employee, right? Which is the employee that belongs, that this uh, timesheet belongs to, dot ID. No. Name. Sorry. Let's refresh. Yeah, 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 yeah. Floy name Mike Dover. Now I have to play around with the formatting. Oh, yes. The, the other question was, okay, remember that we have to find out if the enter hours controller really needs this new employee. Get rid of that. Get rid of that. And we're just going to keep what? Setting the employee ID, right? So we're really going to just create a new timesheet and set the employee ID to that one value. And that's it. We're not going to touch anything else. Save it. Again, we modify Java. So we do a project, clean, recompiles, repackages, redeploys. Okay. Now, at this point, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get rid of, because I don't want to create the same timesheet over and over again. And notice that we are creating duplicates. See that? I already had a duplicate there. We don't want that. We're going to have to, later on, we're going to have to include code to prevent that. But right now, Let's just get rid of those two records. So there's no March 3rd anymore. And then what we want to do is we want to create a new one, right? And a new one means we're not passing the TID. And this is going to be part of the menu, of course. Going back to Timex. All right, form backing object. Next, new timesheet. Set the employee. Set the peer ending date. Set the status code. Return that. To the init binder. To the reference data. There it is. We're going to select accounting 
four, 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 four. Save. Notice that there's no employee name. Why? We're starting to see the the problems when we when we create a new timesheet, and we don't, that timesheet doesn't have an owner; it just have an employee ID one, right? Then you're trying to show the employee name, and it doesn't exist because it hasn't been saved, so it doesn't it hasn't associated it to any employee yet. So this is stuff that should be coming out of the session. If I'm logging as Mike Dover, I should be be able to create a brand new timesheet with at least Mike Dover's name so that it can show here that it's Mike Dover's name. Not that it hasn't been saved yet as Mike Dover's timesheet, but eventually will. So, so far we have just created a brand new timesheet with employee D1. That's all we've done, right? Let's see if it saves it. Save. Init binder. Unsubmit. We're going to convert that command into a timesheet. Let's take a look at the timesheet. Department ID 1, but the department is null. The employee ID is 1, but the employee is null. Status code, the period and the date. Okay, we're going to run it. Did it create it? Yes, it did. 240, 240, 240. It created it. Department ID 1. From employee ID 1. Now what's going to happen if we go back to it? What do you think is going to happen? It will pick up everything else. So you click on it. Where are you, Eclipse? Sometimes Eclipse does these weird things. Okay, here it is. Form backing object. So now it does exist because we're passing the parameter. We tell the timesheet manager to get it. And all we have to do is change the status code is depending. We run it, run the binder, run the reference data, and here it is. Employee Mike Dover. So basically my point is at this at this point you know what you're gonna need in your JSP. And you know what exists and what it doesn't. The part that doesn't exist because it hasn't been saved yet in the database and therefore there's no association done, that's something that you have to provide out of the session. So when you ask yourself, what kind of information I'm going to save from this user in the session, it's going to be something like that. It's going to be the name or it's going to be the ID. Because you need to know who is logged in in order to know who owns that whatever that is being created. Okay?